So as Shanique was said, her topic tonight is going to be how do we use EPDs and then how is genetic testing involved in beef cattle selection? And we're really seeing a lot of changes the last five to 10 years, and we have the potential to see a fair bit more advancement the next five to 10 years when it comes to cattle selection, and especially from a genomic standpoint and how that works back into our EPDs. But just to kind of start from the beginning, when we think of EPDs, just realize that stands for expected progeny difference. Basically, what we're talking about there is an EPD is just an estimated measure of genetic impact of a parent on his or her offspring. So if we look at a bull, what genetic impact can he have on his offspring? If we look at a cow, what impact can she have on her offspring? And it's an estimate. We don't know exactly, but with the more information, we have a better idea of where that will be on average, not for an individual animal, but on average. So the easiest way to think about EPDs is just to work through some basic comparisons. So let's say we had two bulls here. So bull A has a yearly weight EPD of 84 and bull B has a yearly weight EPD of 104. And so that doesn't tell us that their calves are gonna weigh 1,000 pounds, 1,200 pounds or something else at a year of age. We're looking at the relative difference between these two sires. So in this case, we have 20 pounds difference in that EPD going from 104 to 84. So if we bred these two bulls to similar type cows, on average, we would expect the calves out of bull B to be 20 pounds heavier at a year of age than the calves out of bull A. So that's one way we can use EPDs is compare two bulls within a breed. Another way we can use EPDs is to compare that bull back to the breed average. So in this situation, let's just say bull A has a birth weight EPD of negative one, bull B has a birth weight EPD of 1.5, okay? And so we were just comparing those two there, there's a two and a half pound difference there. But without knowing the breed average, we really don't know if those bulls are easy calving bulls or maybe they're bulls that have a little higher birth weights that we would maybe wanna focus for use on cows. So we need to know what the breed average is so we can compare back to that. So in this example, the breed average would be three. And so both of those bulls would be below breed average, one of them extremely easy calving and the other bull still considered a very easy calving bull. Don't get real hung up on the negative or positive. What we're really worried about is the absolute difference and the difference in relation to breed average. One question that comes up a lot is some people have the misconception that the breed average is always gonna be zero. The way breed associations work this is at some point in time for each EPD, they did have the breed average set to zero. But as they make genetic progress, that breed average is gonna change from year to year. And so that's why you don't see the breed average set at zero anymore is because of that genetic progress those breed associations have made. When we look at EPDs, there's a lot of different EPDs out there and different breeds will have different ones, but gonna go through some of the more common ones in the group we talk about them in. And then if you're seeing the number next to the side of the EPD, what that is is a heritability estimate. Uh, and for the majority of these, these are gonna be heritability estimates published by the Angus Association. Uh, and then the two in red would be from the Shoreline Associations. Some breeds you can go into their website and they readily publish this information. Other breeds, they don't put it on the website. So you have to go through other channels to kind of get those estimates. But to kind of give you an idea of how heritable is this trait? So how much selection pressure can we put on a particular trait? So the higher the number, the more impact we can have from a genetic standpoint, the lower the number, the lower heritability. So there's other environmental factors that are gonna have a bigger impact on that trait. So if we look at what we would refer to as our production EPDs, one that you hear talked about a lot is calving ease direct. And you'll see this reported as a percentage. So you may see one bull that has a plus 10 and one bull that has a plus 15. So what we would be looking at is that difference of 5% 
And what that would tell us is the bull with the higher calving ease direct EPD, we expect to have 5% of his daughters, or excuse me, not his daughters, but the heifers we breed him to, we would expect less calving problems out of them. Uh, but as you can see, calving ease direct heritability estimate only 0.19. And one of the reasons I use the Angus Association is they're going to be the largest breed in the United States. So we have the most animals going into those heritability estimates. So that helps increase the accuracy of that estimate. Next EP there is birth weight. So we would see that in pounds. So just like that example we used previously. So the heritability estimate there is 0.46. This is gonna be one of the more highly heritable traits. So if we are selecting on Cavanese, we can definitely have a big impact on birth weight. Um, some people prefer to use just Cavanese direct because it's a combination of a calving ease and score that's reported to the breed association. So was that calf born without any assistance? Was there light assistance? Was there mechanical assistance? Or was there a C-section there? And so calving ease direct is actually a combination of the, the birth weight EPD and the calving ease score. I personally, especially because of the heritability estimates, I look at both of these, but I tend to look at birth weight maybe a little bit more. And then if we look at weaning weight EPD 0.28 uh, compared to the yearling weight EPD of 0.2 heritability estimate. So that tells us the heritability is much higher for yearling weight than it is weaning weight. So weaning weight, we see more variation and differences of weaning weight due to what we would call environmental factors. And what we mean by environmental factors is what was the nutrition uh, so how good was the forage? Was that operation in the drought? Do they have a marginal forage program or do they have a really good forage program? Um, how well did those cows milk? So those kind of things really that impact uh, in nutrition of that cow as well as environment from a climate standpoint. So when we say environment in the context of genetics, we're thinking nutrition, environment, or climate and then other factors, all those will be tied up into environment, not just the, the weather there. Um, so if I'm selecting for growth, I tend to really focus on the yearling weight EPD and really don't pay much attention personally to the weaning weight EPD. Not to say you can't, uh, just telling you what I tend to do when I'm looking at bulls. The other reason I tend to look at yearling weight EPD a little more is if we think about weaning those calves and then preconditioning them before we sell those animals, they're gonna be you know, 45, uh, 60, 75 days, maybe 90 days post weaning by the time we sell them. So that we think about growth, that gives us a little better idea if we use yearly weight as a growth curve and, and it does have a higher heritability estimate than the weaning weight there. Scrotal circumference EPD, really not one to worry about a tremendous amount unless you're a seed stock producer that's raising bulls to sell to other producers. And then definitely you wanna pay attention to the scrotal circumference EPD. If you're buying bulls just to use in your herd where you're gonna be selling those calves, we really wanna look at the actual scrotal circumference more than the scrotal circumference EPD in that situation but you can see scrotal circumference, again, another very highly heritable uh, trait. But those would be what we would consider our production EPDs. And the majority of the major breed associations are gonna have all these EPDs available. Uh, when we look at what we refer to as our carcass EPDs, uh, so marbling is gonna be one of those. And the units it's reported in is actually called USDA marbling units, what you just want to remember is the higher the number, the more marbling that animal is going to have. And again, very high heritability estimate for marbling, uh, 0.48. Carcass weight. So let's think about we retain ownership of those cattle through the feedlot and then we sell them at the packing plant and we're actually selling on a carcass weight basis rather than a live weight basis. This would be an EPD you would want to look at if you're retaining ownership it's reported in pounds. So again, the higher the number, the heavier the carcass weight if all those calves were managed the same. And we do see uh, a pretty high 
high uh, heritability estimate again there. Sometimes what you'll see is sometimes some really light muscled animals may have a little lower carcass weight EPD compared to those that are maybe a little closer to average or above average from a uh, muscling standpoint. Ribeye area EPD, uh, heritability of 0.32, so kind of in that moderate range. This is one that I think sometimes people focus on too much is ribeye area in cattle. It would re be reported in square inches. It is something if you're retaining ownership to be aware of, but what you wanna be cautious of is you can actually select for too much ribeye area where we get ribeyes too big where they may not meet certain grids. Because if we think about buying a steak, we typically buy those by the, you know, you go to a restaurant, you may buy a 12 ounce or a 16 ounce ribeye. And so think about if that ribeye is really big to hit that 12 or 16 ounces, they're gonna have to cut that ribeye very thin. And so that's why some grids out there these days will actually have a ribeye area spec that if you're too small, you get a discount. If you're too big, you get a discount on there. So bigger is not always better. Kind of as a side note, when we look at the weight, we tend to uh, slaughter most cattle out these days where they're in excess of 900 pounds on a carcass weight basis a lot of times. Ribeyes have gotten so big in a lot of situations that the packers actually have gone in there and removed that top little muscle that sits on the ribeye so then they can sell the rest of the ribeye at that little uh, more desirable thickness there. Then we look at a fat EPD, again, uh, moderate from a heritability standpoint. And if we think about this one, what's considered good really depends on what you're gonna be doing with those animals. So if you're gonna be taking all the animals out of a bull and they're all gonna be going to slaughter and sold on a grid standpoint, then a leaner animal would be better, okay, in that situation because we have less fat and more muscle cell and that would play back into our yield grade. But if we think about keeping females out of that bull to put back into our cow herd, I would actually may wanna go the other direction and those bulls that under the same management condition are siring offspring with a little more external fat, or we can think about that as a little more flexing, fleshing ability, that could be valuable from a female standpoint. So when we look at fat, it really depends on what side of the equation, what you're gonna be doing on those calves as far as how you may wanna put uh, emphasis there. And again, the majority of the beef breeds out there would have these carcass weight EPDs. When we think about maternal EPDs, so some EPDs that would be important if we're planning on keeping heifers out of that bull that we purchase, uh, calving ease maternal. So calving ease direct is the direct effect of this bull when we breed him to a group of heifers, are we gonna have problems out of him uh, as, full, as far as pulling calves? When we talk about calving ease maternal, we think of this bull, the daughters we keep out of him when we breed those daughters, would we tend to have uh, more problems or, or less problems out of there? So that's what we mean by Kevin is maternal is on the daughter side, Kevin is direct, is that direct mating there. Uh, you can see pretty similar to Kevin is maternal heritability estimate about 0.2, so not extremely high there. But if we are gonna be keeping replacement heifers, definitely something I wanna pay attention to. The higher the number would be more desirable in that situation. Some breeds will report a heifer pregnancy EPD. We definitely don't see this with all the breeds, but we do see it with some. You can see it's gonna be, uh, of all the EPDs, the Angus Association reports, it's actually the second lowest from a heritability standpoint. So just saying it's a little harder to make genetic progress in that area, and we see a little more variation in heifer pregnancy due to environmental conditions and those things. And when we think about it, that definitely makes sense because there's so many things that go in to getting that heifer pregnant and keeping that heifer pregnant. But if we're gonna be uh, selecting bulls to keep daughters, something I wanna pay attention to, but I may not put quite as much emphasis on it as I do other traits, I may have a, a willingness to have a wider range of acceptable EPDs for those bulls that I'm gonna select there. 
when, and it's percentage as well, the higher the number, the better in those situations. Milk EPD is actually the lowest heritability estimate. Um, so we see a tremendous amount of variation. So sometimes again, maybe pay a little too much attention to the CPD, not that we don't wanna pay attention to it, but realize there's a tremendous amount of variation uh, that's explained by the environment as opposed to the genetics of that animal there. Now, when we talk about milk EPD, it's reported in pounds, but it's not pounds of milk produced, it's pounds of additional weaning weight of that calf due to the milk production of its dam. Okay, so if we look at one cow that has a milk EPD of 20 and another cow that has a milk EPD of 23, what we're talking about there is that the cow with a milk EPD of 23, we would expect her uh, offspring to be three pounds heavier at weaning due to slightly higher uh, milk production for her. Where we really wanna pay attention to milk production is if we get into extreme environments, so when we look at the uh, Central Texas or East Texas, or especially as we move towards the East Coast in the United States of higher rainfall areas, we can tend to have a little heavier milking cow because we typically have a little more forage production in those situations. As we get West into some more arid environments where we may be stocking a cow to every 100 acres, we wanna be a little more conservative on that milk because in those environments, we can easily get to cows that are too heavy milking for that environment. Another EPD we talk about is mature weight. So if we think about, we don't wanna keep, you know, if we got cows at a weight we like them, whether that's 1300 pounds, uh, 1350 pounds, whatever it is, we can look at mature weight to make sure we don't continue to increase that drastically, or in some cases to make sure we don't get it any smaller if we have some cows that we don't want to decrease in size. And again, it would be reported um, from the standpoint of pounds. The higher the number, the bigger those cows are going to be when they're mature. And when we think about mature weight, that would be a cow uh, basically five years of age or older. That would be in a body condition score five. That would be open or either in the first trimester of pregnancy. I will tell you, you kind of have to pay a little attention depending on the breed association here because some breeds, even though they report a mature weight EPD, they may not have a lot of data that goes into that, and they may actually be doing it off of a correlation from another trait like yearling weight. And if that's the case, that's, that's not the best uh, way to approach that because then you can't select for rapid early growth and then hold mature weight steady. What you end up doing if you're selecting for growth, you're constantly moving mature weight. So just make sure you, you have an idea of just how much data is available for mature weight in the breed that you may be interested in. Some breeds will actually have some EPDs for uh, udder score and teat score as far as that udder, is it suspended well and correctly? Uh, and then if we look at teats, are they a reasonable length? We don't have any balloon teats or anything like that. Um, the Angus Association doesn't report that, so I pulled these from the Charlay Association. We, we typically think about Charlay uh, being very strong in some of the terminal traits, uh, but as a breed, they're actually putting some emphasis on some internal traits in relation to udder and teat quality there. And if we look at uh, heritability estimates uh, on the lower end, but not quite as low as what we would see on heifer pregnancy or milk. And again, the higher the number, the more desirable, uh, generally speaking, for those traits. So these would be maternal traits that we would be thinking about if we keep, if we're keeping heifers. And then the last several years, we've started classifying some EPDs from a management standpoint. And one of those is docility. And some breeds report this, some breeds don't. Uh, if we look at heritability estimate, it's really high one of the higher heritability estimates we see from an EPD standpoint. It's very easy to see the benefit of docility from just being around cattle and handling them, but there's actually some benefits from an operation standpoint, um, from the standpoint of 
we do see some differences in carcass characteristics due to docility with those uh, more docile animals being more favorable. If we think about the animals that are more likely to tear up fences or equipment, it's gonna be those wild, wilder animals compared to the more docile ones. So that's something, especially if you're keeping heifers, probably wanna pay attention to, and even just dealing with some of those calves, that may be something that's higher on the list in your operation. Uh, the next two uh, would be claw set and foot angle. Um, so when we think about claw set, we're talking about the shape of that claw. Do we have any kind of an abnormal shape or a, a screw claw type shape or something like that? The higher the number, the better uh, that's gonna be. When we look at foot angle, that's gonna be the angle of that foot. So how deep or how shallow that heel is, you want a deeper heel because when you get a shallow heel, what happens is those toes tend to grow longer and we tend to see a little bit more lameness in some of those cattle. So that's something, especially if you're gonna be keeping replacement heifers and the breed reports that, that's something I would wanna pay attention to uh, selecting bulls that I'm gonna keep replacement heifers out of. And even if you're thinking about retaining animals through the feedlot, uh, that could be important because if we have really poor foot quality, we see more lameness. With increased lameness, we see reduced performance in those animals. So it's typically listed as a management EPD, but definitely has some maternal implications there as well. Now it's one that's a little bit different. The way the Angus Association has it set up is the lower the number, the more desirable there. Uh, so you just wanna make sure you pay attention to that. Now, when we look at that, it's real easy to get overwhelmed when you, when you go to start selecting bulls. So what I always encourage everybody to do is pick the three to five EPDs that are gonna be most important for your operation and really just focus on those. Don't try to look at every single one. The other thing is don't get real hung up on maybe this bull's in the top 1% or 5% for this EPD. But if that's not an EPD that's extremely important to you, then it, it's not one you need to focus on. Focus on those EPDs that are important to you and don't get distracted that a bull may rank very high in an EPD that just doesn't have as much influence for your operation. So pick those few that are gonna be more important. When we're thinking about selling those calves uh, at weaning or through a preconditioned calf sale, the things I would tell you to really focus on there is gonna be, we gotta get that live calf on the ground. So calving ease, direct and birth weight, and then that yearling weight EPD uh, would, would really be what I would focus on there. If we think about keeping replacement heifers, we're thinking about these maternal EPDs, we're thinking about docility, we're thinking about foot quality. On growth, I wanna be careful about selecting too much growth because I can easily get into females that start getting bigger than what I want. So sometimes if we're thinking about keeping replacement females, we're looking at being more moderate from a growth standpoint. Um, this is just showing you how you can go to the breed association and pull some of these heritability estimates. So these are the numbers I have on the previous slide, just showing you where I pulled those from uh, actually earlier today. Now there are some other EPDs out there that we just have to be mindful of how we interpret those EPDs. So I've already mentioned fat, that depending on what you're doing with those animals, a really lean animal may be more beneficial uh, if we're gonna be just sending everything to the feedlot. If we think about uh, keeping replacement heifers, I may want something that's on the other end of the spectrum. So that animal that's in a lower percentile uh, as for, and the breed may actually be better when we think about keeping for females. Dry matter intake is, is one that some people automatically think, man, I want one that eats less. Well, you have to realize that that can be a double-edged sword. Sometimes they may eat less and they may not grow as well. Or especially if we're on a low quality forward situation, they may not have enough capacity to eat as much as what we would like there. So that's really something I would look at the other traits first, especially when we're thinking about retaining something in the feedlot. And then that would be lower on my list that I may use to, to split some of those bulls. But depending on what you're doing, you, you gotta be very mindful of that dry matter intaking 
and just be careful about maybe over-selecting for it. The stability EPD is one that seems uh, very useful initially, but then we have to think through how it's calculated and why some people may call some cattle and realize we have to be careful how we interpret that. So typically the way most breeds will define the stability EPD is what's the chance of that cow being in the herd at the age of six or older? So is she staying in the herd longer? So on the surface, that seems like, yeah, that's something I would really want to pay attention to. But sometimes when we look at the way the seed stock industry works today is they may call those animals because maybe they weren't elite for this growth trait. And so rather than continuing to breed that animal, they may actually use that cow as a recip cow. So it's not because she wasn't fertile or she wasn't productive, she just wasn't meeting a certain set of parameters that particular breeder was looking for. With some breeds that have more than one color in the breed, maybe the animal was called from a color standpoint. And so just be mindful of that and, and stay ability why if we only called for certain things would be a great EPD because of all the various things different breeders call for, uh, this may not really lead you down the road you were expecting it to. And then when we look at indexes, that's really become popular with a lot of breeds. I personally don't spend very much time looking at indexes. I like to look at the individual EPDs better. But if you do look at the indexes, make sure it's an index that's appropriate for your situation. Um, and then realize bulls can reach the same index level for very different reasons. And so one bull with the index may match your herd better than the other. So one way you could potentially use indexes if you wanted to was kind of as an initial sorting criteria of those bulls saying, if the bull doesn't have at least this index, I'm not gonna look at him. And then once I eliminate those, then look through the other bulls if you wanted to. But just be mindful, there's a lot of different ways we can get to that certain index on that animal. So one question that comes up a lot when we think about EPDs is can we compare different breeds? And so in this case, I'm just gonna say, can we compare the EPDs of this Brangus bull, or excuse me, this beef master bull here to this Angus bull? And the answer would be no, we cannot directly compare those uh, EPDs. And I realize some of you are out there saying, well, I thought there's some breed adjustment factors. And, just hold on, we'll get to those in a minute, but we definitely cannot directly compare those two breeds. If we look at the Scimitar bull here and the Red Angus bull, and we pose that same question, can we directly compare those EPDs? And the answer 10 years ago was no. The answer today is yes, we can actually compare those EPDs. And the reason being is there's several breeds within the United States that have gone in together and they have the same group that's calculating their EPDs. And here just recently, they put all those EPDs on the same base. Some of them they've had on that base for a while, but here just in the last couple of years, they've added the rest of them. And those would be breeds that use the International uh, Genetic Solutions Group or what's referred to as the IGS group uh, to calculate their EPDs. So if we're talking about Red Angus, if we're talking about Simmental or any of the Simmental derivatives, Gelby, Limousine, and again, the derivatives of these. Uh, so Balancer or Limflex, Shorthorn, Main Angie, Kianina. They're all on the IGS base. And so we can directly compare them. And so I realize that gets a little confusing. There's some breeds we can directly compare there's some we can't. The easy solution is if you're unsure, just don't directly compare those breeds. Uh, if you're using some kind of a multi-breed rotation, then this can come into play to, to really have that ability to directly compare those breeds in a rotation. Now, some of you may be thinking, you'll see in some of the popular press magazines that there's a group uh, from the Meat Animal Research Center that publishes what they call the EPD breed adjustment. I would just say be cautious about using those uh, because we are seeing there's some varying opinions on how appropriate they are out there and how well they match. When we look at the IGS group, 
compared to the MARC group, we, we don't see consistency there. And those MARC EPDs are only calculated uh, from that research herd there in Nebraska. And so then we get into some environmental conditions, especially when we start looking at some of our, our Brahmin influence animals. So I would just say, if you are looking at those uh, EPD breed adjustments, just make sure you realize everything that goes into that and where they may be more useful and where you may need to be a little more cautious about using those. One thing that's really important when we look at EPDs is what we would call the percentile table. So we can look for a certain animal, where do they rank in the breed? Are they the top 5%, the top 25%? Are they above breed average? Are they a below breed average? And so again, for the, the major beef breeds out there, you can typically go to their website and pull a percentile table and they'll have it for non-parent animals. Uh, those are animals that haven't had a calf or some breed associations will say less than three years of age are active sires or active dams. The non-parent is the one we want to focus on. And so again, pick those EPDs you're interested in and then decide how much emphasis do you want to put on that? What kind of range? So maybe on birth weight, you want those animals to be in the top 25% of the breed. But if we look at milk, potentially, you would be happy with anything from the top 15% of the breed to the top 75th percentile of the breed. So just a way for you to look at those animals and see how they compare to other animals within the breed. And realize these do change every year because of genetic progress in the breeds. So make sure you do uh, pull a current one when you get ready to look at that. Another way you can do, and this will vary from breed association to association. Some of them, even if you're not a member of that association, you can go online and put in the registration number for the animal and it'll show you the EPDs and the percentile rank for the animal. So the Angus Association is one of those uh, that does that. So this is a bull I went in and pulled. And so you can see the EPD, what the actual number is, but then where that animal ranks within the breed for those various traits. There's no bull that's gonna be at the top of the breed for every trait. So that's why we have to look and decide what do we wanna put the most emphasis on uh, for those animals. So what information goes into those EPD calculations? Well, the performance of the animal, the performance of any of its offspring, or we would refer to those as progeny, as well as the performance of its relatives, especially those immediate relatives. And then something that's really coming into play uh, the last 10 years or so, uh, some breeds we see more genomic testing than others, but that genomic information gets worked back into that EPD. And that previous example, that bull we were looking at here, this is a yearling bull, but he has pretty high accuracies here. That, so that's the EPD. The next number here is the accuracy and the percentile rank. These are high accuracies, and that's because that bull, he doesn't have any progeny yet, but he has been genomically tested. And so we have a much better idea of where we expect that animal to end up moving forward. The other thing, and I kind of highlighted this earlier when we were talking about mature weight, but just how much data does that breed association have for those various traits? So again, if we look at here, and this was pulled last fall, yearly weight uh, records from the Angus Association, uh, 4.6 million records, individual animals they have records on. If we look at the newer uh, foot claw set and foot angle EPDs, as of last fall, just a little over uh, 30 some odd thousand for those, uh, which is, is a lot compared to some things, but obviously the more data we have, the better off we're gonna be. If you're looking for a publication to kind of have as a reference document, the beef.tamu.edu website that I talk about quite a bit, you can go there and this is a publication, Dr. Steve Hammock and Joe Paschal have put together on EPDs to help as a reminder as far as what units they're reported in and what you wanna look at for those various EPDs. Kinda of wanted to spend the last half of the session tonight talking about genetic testing since we are seeing 
that uh, play a bigger and bigger role in the seed stock industry. And we're starting to see maybe a more role in the commercial industry, depending on what breeds uh, we're talking about there. And so when we think about genetic testing, what we're really thinking about is looking at those genes. And so when we think about a gene, we're really just talking about a piece of DNA for a specific trait, okay? Now realize there's some traits out there that there's multiple genes that are gonna affect that trait. So yearling weight would be an example of that. And when we think about a gene, that animal is gonna have two alleles for that gene, okay? So they're gonna come in pairs. And so we'll talk about coat color and use that as an example here in a minute. But what we would talk about there, those two alleles there would be like a big B or a little B here. So maybe two copies of the big B or two copies of the little B. That's what we're talking about with those alleles. When we think about cattle, it's estimated cattle based on what we know at this point in time have about 20,000 different genes and those genes are gonna be spread across 30 pairs of chromosomes out there. So one term you may hear is a genetic marker because we may not know the exact gene or that exact information, but we know this area of DNA located on this chromosome tends to be related to this trait. So that's the markers we're looking at. So it's just a DNA sequence with a known location on a chromosome. It can be long or it can be short, but it's associated with that characteristic. So we don't know exactly, we just know it's associated with that. One thing you'll hear about some is something called SNP testing. SNP just stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. Just remember the SNP here. But if you'll think about to uh, back to a biology class or genetics classes where you were talking about A's and T's and G's and C's, that's where this comes into play here. Um, so the single just means one location, one of these base pairs. Nucleotide is that actual A, T, G, or C. And polymorphism is just a scientific way to talk about it's going to be different at that location. So if we kind of look at it here, again, this is a DNA molecule, and we see the different A's, T's, and G's, and C's here. And so when we talk about that single nucleotide polymorphism, everything's the same on these two DNA molecules, except for this single nucleotide here, we see this difference from the top one and the bottom one. That's actually what they're looking at when we're doing genetic testing is those differences in those SNPs there. Uh, we have to realize though, when we talk about these genomic predictions and this genetic testing, it's only gonna be as good as the phenotypic data that it's built off of or the phenotypic database it's built from. And what we mean by a phenotype is that's just the visual things or the performance we see out of its, those animals. So it has the genetics, but how did it perform from a birth weight standpoint? How did it perform from a weaning weight standpoint? And just to kind of to show you how this can be important, especially for any of the breeders out there, why it's important to turn in data on all the animals and not just some of the animals is because that affects the ratio, which then affects the EPDs of those animals. So this happens to be an example that was put up, put together by Dr. Tommy Perkins, who used to work for the Bringus Association. And just showing the simple example with five animals here, the weaning weights and looking at their ratios. So the ratio just means how do they compare to the other animals in the group? 100 is gonna be average. Above 100 is above average, below 100 is gonna be below average. So if we look at this animal four here, he had a weaning weight ratio of 90. That just tells us he's 10% below the average. And this is where EPDs start at, is with these ratios here. Unfortunately, sometimes what happens is a breeder may not report EPDs from all the animals because they say, well, this one's just not very good. I'm gonna cull it. When they do that, that changes the ratios of all the other ones, and even if we called two. So the more data, the bigger those contemporary groups, the more complete data we have reported into that database, the better our genomic predictions are gonna be. And without actually collecting this phenotypic database, our genomic predictions aren't gonna work. So we always are gonna to have to collect this data to make sure we keep adjusting 
those genomic predictions to continue to make them as good as possible. Um, this is a statement I actually took for Dr. Jared Decker out of University of Missouri. I'm not even trying to reword it because he did a, an excellent job of, of wording it and I, and I can't come up with a better way to say it. Uh, but a quote he used in one of his articles is, the more animals that we have genotyped, so we've done that genetic testing on them, and those animals are correctly phenotyped, meaning we collected those phenotypes, we had good contemporary groups, we reported the data from all the animals, the more precise that genomic prediction is gonna be in the future. So we have to have both of those, and the more data we have going into that, the better we're gonna be. What is the benefit of genetic testing? There's a lot of different benefits uh, for some traits. We can find out if those animals are heterozygous or homozygous for a given gene. So if we think about polled or horned and our non-Brahmin influence breeds. Um, so if they're homozygous, that means they have two copies for the polled gene. Any non-Brahmin influence animal we breed them to, we're gonna end up with the polled calf in that situation. If the heterozygous, they're gonna have one copy of each. And so we'll see some horned animals and some polled animals. Uh, coat color for those breeds that have multiple coat colors. One of the really interesting things and useful things that have come from genetic testing is identifying incorrect pedigrees. And so that's kind of easy to see how that could happen on the bull side of things that maybe we grabbed the wrong straw of semen when we were AI in that cow or maybe a bull jumped the fence, got in and bred some cows and jumped back out and, and we didn't realize that. So we can pick that up with genetic testing. The other place that's really come into play is we found out there's sometimes we have the wrong calf assigned to the wrong cow. You say, well, how does that happen? I know that's the calf that's been nursing that cow. Well, what we're finding in some situations when a lot of cows are synchronized and bred at the same time, so they're all calving at the same time, you may have two cows that lay down near each other, calve at the same time. They may actually swap calves at birth. And so genetic testing has helped us identify those kind of things. It's helped us with genetic defects, okay? And this is just a list of some of those that are out there. Uh, realize we're likely to discover more genetic defects in cattle, but being able to, to identify them will help us do a better job of breeding those cattle and making sure we avoid passing on some of these genetic defects. Just to kind of work you through coat color as kind of an example here when we talk about heterozygous and homozygous and dominant and recessive alleles. So when we think about coat color, black will be dominant to red, all right? Uh, meaning you only need one copy of that black hair coat gene for that animal to be black phenotypically. Uh, they may be heterozygous from a genetic standpoint. So if we look at a black bull here and he's uh, homozygous for the black trait, meaning he has two copies of the big B, that dominant allele, we breed him to a red cow. So red's gonna be recessive. So you have to have two copies of the recessive gene to be red there. When we breed those animals and think back to that Punnett square from a genetics class we may have taken at some point in time, all those animals are gonna be heterozygous, okay? So they're all gonna get a big B and a little B, but because all of them have a big B, 100% of those calves would be black padded. If we look at here, two animals that have a black hair coat but are both heterozygous, so they carry one gene for the black trait, one gene for the red trait. When we breed those, 25% of those animals are gonna be homozygous black, 50% of the animals will be heterozygous black, so they carry a black gene and a red gene. So when we put all together, 75% of them are gonna be black, but we can actually get a red calf out of these, both uh, animals with the black hair coat here, because 25% of the time, they're gonna get the red recessive gene from the sire and 25% of the time, a red recessive gene from the dam. If we look at uh, a red animal bred to a heterozygous black animal, okay? So this red bull is always gonna give the red trait, 
the black animal with them carrying a black trait plus a red trait, 50% of the time they get a black gene, 50% of the time they get a red gene. So we'd see half the calves being black, half the calves being red in that situation. And then when we breed two red animals together, we're gonna get 100% of those calves are gonna be red. Now we have other modifying genes that are gonna affect things as far as whether they may have uh, be a baldy or motley face, or maybe they may have some different color on their legs, or maybe there's a diluting gene. But when we think about the base hair coat, this kind of work you through how those dominant and recessive genes work. I mentioned parent to te parenting testing earlier. Uh, one of the misconceptions that comes along with this is that we're identifying exactly which animal is there. In reality, what we're doing is we're excluding animals that can't be the parents. And then through process of elimination, we identify who are gonna be the most likely parents in that situation. Uh, if you're interested in some more reading on that and some other genetic topics, there's a group of extension beef cattle geneticists across the country that work on some of these things together. And their website is ebeef.org. And this is where that document on parentage testing came from and some other ones I'll reference here in a minute. So when we think about genes and we think about genetic testing, some questions kind of come up and, and it may seem straightforward and, and the top two are, the third one's not here, but what percent of the, of the genes come from the bull? And basically when we're talking about uh, nuclear DNA, it would be coming 50% uh, from the bull and 50% from the cow. There's a little bit of mitochondria DNA that, that really comes from the cow side of things, but don't get hung up on that we're looking at that DNA that's coming from the nucleus, uh, or we would call that nuclear DNA. Now, what percentage of the DNA comes from the grandparents? And so if we think about those four grandparents, on the surface, we would just assume 25% of that animal's DNA would come from each one of those grandparents. What we've learned through genetic testing is that's not the way it works, and we see quite a bit of variation around that. And that's why we see a lot of variation in flush mates from time to time. So these happen to be two bulls uh, that were out of the same flush uh, from a breeder that were both used pretty heavily in AI. And so when they were born, because we didn't have genetic testing at that point in time, they had the same EPDs, okay? But after they were mated to a bunch of cows over time, you can see they really spread themselves where this bull little higher birth weight, but much more growth. This bull, his flush mate, easy calving bull, less growth there, okay? And so we knew there's, there's variation in those flush mates. Uh, this is an example showing now, this was a sale catalog I pulled from last year. This was actually, they were selling some open yearling heifers, so they haven't had any calves yet. But if we look at these flush mates here, we see quite a bit of difference in their EPD. So these two kind of round breed average for birth weight, this extremely high birth weight heifer. Um, we look at marbling, these much lower than this one. Genetic testing has let us identify those vari that variation in these flush mates that we used to not. Now, as we get more data, we may still see a little bit more, but the genetic testing really gives us a much better idea of where these animals are likely to end up and what their true genetic potential is compared to if we didn't have genetic testing, we had to wait till we get all those progeny on the ground. This is kind of showing how this happens. This is coming uh, from Dr. Decker again. This is an image I borrowed from him. But if we look at these two flush mates down here, and so this one he identified as the high ranking flush mate, this one he identified as the low ranking flush mate. And so we think about their four grandparents here. And so coming from the sire side, 50% of the genes are gonna come from these two parent, grandparents, but it may not be 25% from each one. And in this case, and this is a real example, it wasn't. So this high ranking animal, actually 35% of his DNA came from this paternal grandsire and only 15% came from the paternal granddam. And then we see from this set of grandparents, fairly equal 
if we look at this low ranking flush mate, happen to be from these two grandparents fairly equal, but we look at these two grandparents, 32% of the DNA came from this maternal granddam, only 18% of the DNA came from that maternal grandsire. And so seeing how we see that variation and how that DNA is passed along helps us better understand the variability we see in these flush mates. This is a paper that really looks at that, talking about just how much gene segregation we get when we think about that bull producing all of those sperm cells, that cow producing those egg cells there, and all the various combinations, because we think about all those genes and those 30 different chromosomes, and there's just millions and millions and millions of possible combinations that we can get there. It's estimated typically over a billion possible combinations just in that one sperm cell. So depending on which one of those billion from that bull impregnates that egg, impacts that variation we see. And that's why we see in a flush, you may have some animals that you really like in a flush, some that are kind of average, and some that you're just not very crazy about. And that has to do to this random variation in that gene segregation there. This is just showing it a little bit more that theoretically it's possible almost all the majority of the genes could come from one side of the pedigree versus the other on the extreme. In reality, most of the time we see this variation more in the middle here. When we look at genomic testing, what that does is give us an idea of what that animal is going to do in his offspring. And the way a lot of breed associations will talk about it is the genetic testing, how many progeny would it take to accomplish what we're seeing with the genetic testing? And so you'll see variations in the different traits. So Angus, one of their last reports out there, just with genetic testing would be equivalent to actually getting 23 calves out of that bull that we had a birth weight on. If we think on the female side, that cow, unless she's an ET cow, we're never gonna get that many progeny out of her. So a tremendous amount of information we gain from that EPD or from that genomic testing, I should say, to help enhance that EPD. We look at some of the traits, not quite as many there, uh, but if we look at something like milk, uh, a tremendous amount in improvement and having a better idea of where we're gonna be from a milk standpoint on that animal. When we look at genetic testing, uh, we think about collecting a sample. Historically, that's been uh, a blood or hair sample. When we're talking about hair sample, we gotta make sure we get the roots of those hair there. What we're seeing moving forward used quite a bit more is what we call a TSU or a tissue, a tissue sampling unit. Kind of think about like an ear tag gun, but when you squeeze this, it actually collects a little sample from the ear in the tube there, and then you send that off to the lab. Um, we're, we already see, and we're likely gonna see more different uh, fees from the company you send that to, whether you use this or whether you use blood or hair, they may charge you a little bit more if you're using blood or hair. There's two primary companies out there doing genomic testing. There's other ones, but these are two of the main ones. Uh, Neogen and Zoetis. We do see differences on how things are handled if we're talking on the seed stock side of things versus the commercial side of things. If we're talking about on seed stock animals, the genetic test gets sent to the breed association and then the breed association sends it into one of the two companies. From a commercial standpoint, for the most part, you're sending it in directly to the company. There are a couple cases where you'll send it into the breed association and then they'll send it in to the company. So looking at Zoetis and their offerings for commercial cattle, uh, these are some, like I said, you send those samples to Zoetis. These are some of their fact sheets on that. They'll break it into for Angus animals and then for other uh, non-Brahmin uh, influenced animals. So you really have to look uh, and see which breeds would be appropriate and so here they have Angus, Red Angus, South Devon, Hereford, Simmental, Gelby, Limousine, and Charlet. Notice you don't see any of the Brahmin influence breeds there. That's because we got to have good databases 
for those breeds to have these tests and that Zoetis just happens to be a little further ahead um, with those breeds. On the Angus side, they define that as females that are greater than 75% Angus. They will only do genetic testing on commercial females, so not seed stock, but commercial animals only on the heifers, not on the bulls. They're gonna report 10 different traits. One of those traits will be heifer pregnancy. Um, this is just showing how they report those and what they consider to be more favorable or less favorable for those various traits. When we look at what they call their inherent select, so this is going to be for those boss taurus females that are comprised of the following eight breeds. So notice no Brahmin influence in there. That's what we mean by boss taurus is no Brahmin influence. Uh, again, heifers only, 16 individual traits. But at this point in time, heifer pregnancy is not one of those. So if you're thinking about keeping replacement heifers, just realize heifer pregnancy is important to a lot of us. They don't have that in the model at this point in time. When we look at Neogen for their commercial side of things, uh, they refer to that typically as their identity profile. And they'll have identity profiles for Angus. They call that their Angus Gold. Uh, so greater than 75%. Agenity beef for these other six breeds here. So the animals that would be less than 75%. Uh, Black Angus, and again, no Brahmin influence there. And then they do offer one for Brangus and one for Gert. Uh, you would need to send that into the Breed Association. Not quite as far along with as many animals incorporating that as we are with some of these other breeds here. Uh, we have heifer pregnancy on the Igenity beef and the Igenity Angus gold. Do not have heifer pregnancy for Brangus or Santa Gertrudis there. These are just showing some of the fact sheets that you can pull for those companies if you're interested in a little more reading on those topics. But again, just wanna emphasize um, the more animals that we genotype and that we have correctly phenotyped the more precise those genomic predictions become. So if we look at some breeds, they may only have several thousand animals genotype. Whereas if we look at other breeds, they may be Angus, for example, genotyping in excess of 100,000 registered animals uh, per year. So we have to realize that not all genomic products are the same, but they should continue to get better as we collect more good phenotype phenotypic data, and they should also get cheaper as technology advances moving forward. And with that, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type those into the chat box or feel free to unmute and be happy to answer any of those questions you may have.